Hello and welcome to Extra Connections. I'm your host, James Live Jr. here of JLJ Media. I'm the JLJ of JLJ Media, of course. And I'm always bringing people to help connect you with and so you can know who they are and what they're doing. So I have an actor who is actually in something that's coming out tomorrow. Because uh, actually, as, we, as this is this October 6th, October 7th, it's called A Murder Street called Amsterdam. Uh, stars Christian Bale, Margot Robbie, John David Washington, some others. It's opening in theaters tomorrow, so he's doing that. He's done all kinds of different films, things on Netflix. We're going to talk about all that kind of stuff he's done there. He also wrote a book mm -hmm. about the late Kobe Bryant. So it's yeah. Also, um, and what he, what he told him. He also was in a show that I actually liked a lot and didn't last very long with The Last Ship. I thought the show had lots of problems. I thought it was good. It didn't, whatever, I like that one. But he has all kinds of stuff going on. We're going to talk to him about life and everything's from Poland. We're going to talk about all this stuff. Martin Harris. How are you doing, Martin? Thank you for having me. Lovely to talk to you. My pleasure. All right, so I want to actually went first with Kobe Bryant because I'm here in Los Angeles. The old legend, you walk anywhere in Los Angeles, you see murals of him and his daughter and all that stuff. And where were you when you found out that he had passed? Okay, so I have to give you a little bit of a backstory. Okay, so, please do. Please do. So, 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 you know, I, I had a heavy metal band that that was my dream. That that uh, like a progressive metal band. I was huge into rock scene in in my high school, and then I thought that that's was what I'm gonna do for the rest of my life. And then the band kind of stopped. You know, we we couldn't go past some differences, <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't know what to do. It's I, know, band. And I didn't know what to do with my life. So I was 18. You know, so I felt like. That's it. I don't know what to do. And uh, and uh, the label asked me to write reviews for them. So I did that, but I couldn't really support myself from writing about heavy metal music. And somebody, uh, you know, told me about becoming a sports writer. And I did that for for 12 years. And I went to New York in 1998 as a 19-year-old kid. And I spoke to Kobe for the first time there. Then I went to uh, that was a, that was his first All Star game. It was my first All Star game. Then I wow. met him throughout different NBA finals, throughout different uh, All Star weekends, and back in 2007, when I decided, you know what, sport, and you know, I have a good career, but it's not really it. You know, it's I feel creatively limited, and I was 30 at the time. I came to Los Angeles for three weeks, and I asked Kobe Bryant, and like give me an advice, what should I do? Should I stick to what I have, what I'm doing? Because it provides, you know, security, it provides a career that I can have for the rest of my life. Or should I go crazy and try something new and move here to Los Angeles? And he said, what is your heart telling you? And I said, my heart is telling me to try. Then he said, then always follow your heart. So I moved to LA in 2008 and we stayed in touch when he played for the Lakers. Then I didn't see him for a few years and I saw him three weeks before he passed on December 29th. And I was already doing acting, but I was still doing other stuff. I was doing yeah. stand-up comedy. I was still writing, you know, still doing a lot of a lot of stuff. So when I found out that he that he died, it was such a shock for me that I like I couldn't do anything for three days. But then I realized, you know, the advice he gave me about about doing what my heart is telling me to do and 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 go with acting, I have to finally just focus on that one hundred percent because that's what Kobe was. When Kobe was doing something, he was doing something one hundred percent. And yeah, and, and I decided to just, just do acting and, and it was a great decision. Late decision, but a great decision. But what do you think, why do you think guys connected? Because I mean, you meet people all the time and you don't, you don't talk to them ever again or, but what do you, why do you think you and Kobe connected? Well, first of all, I, we, we kind of connected more in 2007 because there was a tough time for him, I think, when he was trying to get traded or the people saying that he'll get traded and there were a lot of difficult media questions. So he, I think, I, I, I was an international writer and he was at ease talking to me, kind of, I was a sort of a distraction for him from those other people for, for, for those couple of weeks. And we had a chance to have a couple of, you know, deeper conversations. It's also the background. Uh, he grew up in Europe. I grew up in Europe. He's a huge soccer fan. You know, AC Milan, Barcelona. I actually like different teams. I like Real Madrid and Tottenham. So, but, but you know, there's a lot of a lot of uh, that going on. And I think it was also me coming with uh, with an attitude that I really want to want to try something like try try something that comes from a from a world of passion, like something pure and organic and 
like deep inside, I'll tell you one thing about Kobe. He had such a great heart. He was a he was a loving, loving person. He really was. You know, like when he saw something in you that he generally liked, he really he was both inspiring and inspired. So I want to actually go back also a little bit. That's wonderful. I want to go back a little bit to the heavy metal band. Mm. I do music. I was in a band back in the nineties called Mangina. We did a thing. Oh, nice. We nice. played dance rock music. music. Dance What's rock music. It was there was a time when um because we had we had these, we were like we called ourselves like um Fleetwood Mac meets like I think it was some group called Fisher Spooner at the time, like something really weird or scooter or something. We're like that's whatever it was. We were like we we're kind of a mixture of like techno. We liked rock music. It's, it was crazy. Huh? I was one of the lead singers. Um, I played some drums, but I was the lead singer. But, you know, it was fun, but I do music now. I do now. I do. We do it whole differently now than back then. I'm much older, too. We don't do all the stuff we used to, like you said. But for you, I mean, why, why were you able to kind of leave the music behind, though? Because you were doing it all growing up. Why do you think you were able to leave? I mean, because did you enjoy it when you were doing it in high school? You know what? I think... I had, you know, like we, we all, we all have certain, certain flaws sometimes. I, f I feel like I just quit too, too soon. I, I got discouraged and I, I felt like it's not going to, not going to happen. And, um, and because I wasn't playing like any instrument particularly well, I was more of, I was a singer and I was a creative songwriter, but I didn't, I wasn't like a virtuoso musician that could go yeah. and play for other people. Mm, I, I felt like it's not going to happen. And I, the label offered me to write reviews. I liked that. I was going yeah. to concerts, talking to artists. So, so I liked that side. It just later, when I was a sports writer and sports broadcaster, I felt like there's, I hit the ceiling and there's nothing, nothing more creatively to be inspired by going to 30s, 40s, and so on. You know, I would just pretty much repeat myself for the rest of my life. Yeah. So then you decide, I'm going to go into acting, mm -hmm. which is, I mean, I can't, in, in Los Angeles, where there's a million people here. Yeah. <laughs> Well, but I'm saying, but for you, what it is like a natural progression because you have done music, you have done yeah. sports casting, mm -hmm. you've done you've done writing. So did it feel like a natural thing? Yeah, like going to acting. Yeah, you know, and, and it took me a while to to be comfortable in my own skin, but I, now I under now I finally understand that this is what what was was meant to be for me. You know, that I finally found a career that I really love for the sake of doing it, not for any other reasons. Where before I was I wasn't sure. It's like I really like it. But I could do also this. Maybe I could do that. You know, there, there are a lot of things that I was trying to do in life, and finally, I feel like I found something that I want to do for the rest of my life. That makes sense. We've all had jobs that were there were jobs. There literally there were a yeah, there were a little bit, a little bit more than jobs, but it wasn't right. it wasn't like the it factor. It's it's I don't want to use this reference. It could be a horrible reference, but uh, stay with me for that. It's like you date girls and they're wonderful girls and they're really nice and pretty and or just good yeah and there's something missing you know right. but there's something missing to to say this is the love of my life you know that, so makes, that, sense. Was, that makes sense that makes sense so, okay. so it was more like that i, I enjoyed i enjoyed being uh, in the sports world i enjoyed it it was fun I, I had a chance to visit a lot of countries i had a chance uh, to to travel a lot i I was making good money and it was a uh, recurring paycheck. Not like in acting that you sometimes, you know, you, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You, you can, you can wait for your next gig. And luckily enough, I was, I was working quite a bit last couple of years, but when I started, not, not really the case uh, where this, this is more of a stable, stable job, but you know what? Like Kobe said, go with your heart. I went with my heart. Maybe it was crazy. It was maybe irresponsible, but it worked. How has it been for you being from Eastern Europe mm -hmm. in Hollywood? <laughs> how the, yeah, I'm just curious, how the roles been, what kind of roles have you been getting? Has it been stereotypical roles? Are you finally coming out of that? Like what kind of roles have you been getting? So I grew up partially in Germany. So I speak also perfect German and I speak six more languages. And I would say that was my, <laughs> thank you. That was my selling card that I could play those, those international roles. Like the first bigger movie that I got that, kind of changed my career a little bit was The Hunt. Oh, yeah. And all my lives are in Croatia in The Hunt, where I play the read Croatian agent. So it's, it's a funny scene where, uh, where they both come to me and, and they try to say something and I, you know, like I, don't, I don't understand any English. So. <laughs> yes, I love it. I love it. And I speak with my guy in Croatian and, and then things happen. So 
pretty much German rolls. It's it's my main type of roles I'm getting. And in, in even in Amsterdam, I play a German character. Uh, on Better Call Saul, I play a German character. On The Staircase, I'm German. On some other uh, productions, I'm Russian. On Stranger Things, I'm Russian. On The Red Notice, I'm Russian. Uh, but I also play Czech guys. I play Serbian guys. I even play Danish guy a few times. I just finished an indie film in Michigan a few months ago where I played a Dutch guy. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so that's my that's my forte. Like moving forward, yes, I want to learn Southern accent. I feel okay, and and try those roles. That's very cool. Because I always wonder, because you know, when you come to Hollywood, people will usually cast you what they think you should be doing, right? They go look and you go, oh, you do that? Okay, you'll play terrorists or whatever. You know, like, like you always go that direction. That's very cool. You had you had something in your tool belt, which was different languages. Then you have a look that you could look like any any, any of those different people. I mean, you can look like them. I, I see it. I totally see it. Um, mm -hmm. I, most people in Europe speak more than one language. I speak three. I speak Dutch and, and uh, Spanish and, and English. You speak but, Dutch? You know, a, little, a little bit, because my grandfather's Dutch from Holland. Oh wow! Did did yes. you ever go to Holland, Michigan? No, I know where I know where it is, but I've not that's, been. That's where we did the film. It was it's incredible. Eighty percent people are Dutch of Dutch ancestry. In, in yes. Holland, well, I've been to Dutch country. And stuff. Well, I've been in Dutch country in Pennsylvania, of course, mm -hmm. and then in and and in Ohio, there's mm -hmm. a whole Dutch country also there too. So I've, I've seen so the all over the place. Um, but in America, a lot of people speak just one language, and that's it. So I feel like at least you have a head, a, a you know, a leg over some people. Um, to get different roles and play different characters. That's really good. And you name some roles on some shows mm -hmm. that get attention. The Staircase is getting attention. Stranger Things is getting attention. Mm -hmm. So what has that been like for you to get projects that actually are getting noticed? Whether yeah. you are, that's one thing, but there are projects you're in that literally are getting noticed. Yeah, I mean, the first experience for me to, to be noticed was surprising because I voiced a character on Call of Duty named Kruger, and I wasn't aware it's such a huge fan base of the of those games. And I started receiving messages from people dressing as my character on Halloween. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> they, didn't, they only heard my voice because it's only my voice. And sometimes it's 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 random situations at parties. Uh, I'll give you one. So a friend of mine is a visual artist, and he came to a party with his boss, who is the president of the company, like you know, strong, serious guy. And he told his boss that I'm voicing Kruger on Call of Duty. And this, this guy lost it. He started kissing my forehead and taking photos. So, 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 that, that's, so that was the first glimpse of that. But then what happened after Stranger Things, that is absolutely insane how many people watch that show. Because I was uh, hearing from, from friends that I went to high school with or even prior to that, that I didn't talk to for the last 30 years. Of course. And, <laughs> yeah. That's... Yes. that's that's a that's a different level. I mean, and it's not the biggest role I ever played. Absolutely not. Oh, but, still, not. but still, still, you know, the level of like you say, the recognition because you're on such an iconic show. But I kind of had a feeling that's that's what that what will happen because when, once we were filming, I knew it's gonna be an epic season of Stranger Things. Yeah. I knew I saw what we were doing, you know. So so I knew that that people will react to it. Yeah, no, that's why. That's why I mean, by like, this profession is so unpredictable. That you know, you, you can hit a project that becomes huge. You don't know it, but you're yeah. You can have a bigger part in something smaller. Yeah, that's one thing. But then you get a small part in something bigger. It, it, it's 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 weird. It's weird because it's just like well, like why am I? Hi, you're that guy, and that I've happened to me a couple of times. So you're like, yeah, I'm that guy. I guess you're like, we just like, what are you looking at? You know, it's kind of weird a little bit because you're not huge in the in the project, but the project is huge. Yeah. Uh, so more yeah. eyes. So more eyes are seeing you. There more eyes. Yeah. Are Broke all the viewing records of all time. And yeah. Incredible, incredible story. Yeah, I, I watched it. I mean, I was, I'm, I'm, my whole family watched your fans. Uh, so you are from Poland, correct? Mm -hmm. When you were growing up, did you imagine this at all? Was this, was this a possibility for you to imagine? Something, a life kind of like this? No. You know, I know you were a kid and you know you were going to be an actor stuff. But I'm saying, were possible, was it possible for you like, to, to dream big? Yeah, I always dream big, but I would say my dreams were different. Uh, I'm from like a very conservative family. Uh, back in Poland, my father is a professor of, uh, it's a, he's a college professor. He's a scientist. He, uh, he specializes in history of arts. So all my childhood was a lot of like intellectual stuff, reading a lot of books. I was, uh, I was a nerdy kid. Then I rebelled when I was 15 and heavy metal and, and, and music and hard rock. That was my, my rebel years, you know? So. Yeah, yes. 
but just deep inside, I always had that. Probably that's why I went to to journal to journalism for for quite a while. Deep inside, I had this those boundaries that I should be doing the right thing and you know have a right job and family. And but inside, my soul inside was crazy. So it was always this internal fight where I finally was able to find a balance and, and with acting where I can be a lot of different things at the same time. But uh, my father was a professor of history of arts. I read a lot of historical books. And I believe my dream at the time was to be a professor of history. <laughs> there, there you go. <laughs> so that was a different dream. Yeah. yeah, for yeah. Sure. Uh, yeah. What was culture like for you? Pop culture? We'll say pop culture. To go for mm -hmm. Like, so you do heavy metal, obviously. But over in Eastern Europe, what was it like back then? See, did you guys get a lot of weather? Did you guys have MTV? Did you have Western Europe? Like, what did you get? So this is the interesting part. So I grew up in the 80s in Poland, but also partially in Eastern Germany. That was still behind the iron. Yeah, curtain. yeah. It's like, you know, those yeah. two experiences were completely different. I couldn't wait for those four or five months every year I would spend in Eastern Germany. Because oh. in Poland, there was nothing at store in the stores. Nothing, zero. If we didn't have our little private farm uh, that my grandpa, who's still alive at 101, was running. Yeah, I know. So we were eating our own food, but there was nothing in stores uh, except of vodka. And there was nothing, there, were, there was no chocolate. There was no chocolate at all. And in Eastern Germany, there was chocolate. They even had their own Coca-Cola called Cola Club. Oh. Okay. So, and the life was, it seemed more, a little bit more optimistic. In Poland, it was very gray and people were, you know, yeah. depressed and angry and drinking too much alcohol. And, and in Eastern Germany, even if it was still communism, it felt more open and, and, and I, yeah, I, as a kid where I could eat bananas in Germany, I couldn't eat them in Poland. Definitely like the Eastern Germany part better. That's <laughs> crazy. And it's crazy. I, I just, I, I mean, I, you know, you hear stories like that, but to actually hear someone talk about that, it's like, wow. So you're, you're, you're like Eastern Europe's the place, Eastern Germany's the place. We'll go there. So when you left Poland, where'd you go first? First, well, I was, I was uh, as a reporter, I was flying around a lot. So okay. I was always in, in, you know, on my back. So I was actually spending a lot of time in the United States, like two, three oh, months okay. a year, uh, mainly in the East Coast. But I moved to L.A. in 2007 and uh, 2008, 2008, I moved to L.A. And, and that was it, yeah. What do you like about Los Angeles? I like the opportunities here. Uh, you can spend your time in so many different ways. You can go, I live in Los Feliz. Uh, last Friday, I walked uh, to Greek theater to see one of my favorite bands, Porcupine Tree. I can go to the ocean. I can hike. I can uh, work. I can work out. Uh, yes. Yeah. Different types of people. Uh, but I also like New York. I went to New York to when I worked on the uh, upcoming season of Marvelous Miss Maisel. I was there for, for a week in, in Brooklyn. I loved it. I uh, went to the premiere of Amsterdam, New York. I loved it too. And uh, actually my favorite city in the United States where at some point of my life, I want to I wanna own a house and, and spend there some time. And I spend there, I, used, I, I did spend there some time shooting things like Stranger Things or Staircase. It's Atlanta, Georgia. Yeah. That's my favorite city actually in the United States. Oh, I love it. I, I, Atlanta, I know I love it. I, yeah, yeah. It's, it, it, there's something about it, you know. It's, it's a, it has this homey feeling. I have this homey feeling when I'm in Atlanta. But isn't it true? Cities have feelings. When you go to cities, you get a different feeling. I mean, like you go, LA is different than New York. New York's different than Chicago. Chicago's mm -hmm. different than England, yeah. London. Mm -hmm. London's different than Berlin. Like I'm yeah. sure, it's like every other. They have, they have feelings, don't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. LA is like a little bit of everything, you know. Like I, I live in Los Feliz right now, and I, I find some similarities with New York in Los Feliz. But at the same time, there is a part, you know, park and hiking. So, yeah, it's, I feel like LA is, is almost like a bunch of sitting together, depends where you live. Yes. You know? Yes. I'm down, in, I'm down in Eaglewood. I'm by, I'm by LAX. Oh. I'm right here. So I'm by the water. I'm like, I'm 15 minutes from the water, by the airport. You're right. It's like all these cities put together, just microclimates, every climate's different. Yeah. The city. It's, it's very yeah, much. Yeah, like yeah. Absolutely. 100%. That's very much like that. I love that. Um, so, okay, so do you like auditioning? How do you view auditioning? When you, like, just the, both things. Do you like auditioning or, no, or yes or no? Or do you, how do you view the auditioning? See, I like to have time to prepare for audition. I, uh, I love uh, working on a character. If, if I could be at, at some point at this stage of my career that I only audition for, for the things I'm passionate about, that would be great, you know? But 
I audition a lot. Uh, yeah. some, some, sometimes, you know, you're like, you, you have to audition for that role because that's what required of you, but you, you don't feel that strongly about it, but yeah. you still find your moments, you still find, find the character. And sometimes you're like, this is my role, you know, like I need to get that one. I'm, you know, this, this, this is it. I can 100% see myself playing that role. Yes. And actually when that happens, it's usually, you know what, I, I booked a couple of roles that I felt like, you know, I'm, I'm going to get it. Okay. Okay. Um, I have friends who, they, they feel like it's just part, it's part of the process. It's a mm -hmm. chance to act. Like whether you get the part, I was like, it's a chance to act. You get to act with more people. Um, but are you doing a lot more um, self tapes? Are you? Are you? Are, yeah, because right? yeah, I know it's not fully. We're not fully back into the. No, not really. I, I had maybe one in person audition for the last three years. Yeah. How did you do? How did you do during the pandemic? Because you know, LA everything shut down for like for like six seven months. So I was in Atlanta shooting Red Notice. It was actually the last day of any production I think in America. It was wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was on set, checking already like some messages that people are uh, buying everything in stores in Los Angeles. And I was about to fly the next day. And they told me that there's no toilet paper anywhere. You remember that? I remember that. So, <laughs> so what I did, I went back to the hotel I was staying and I just took two rolls of toilet paper and packed it into my bag. And, and I used it for the first three months of pandemic. I was first, I was like really upset about the pandemic. Well, first month, of course, everybody was scared because yeah, 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 those yeah, yeah, yeah. images from Italy with, with like mass graves or, or whatnot, right. Right. and you're scared. But then after the first month, you start having, you know, the, the thoughts start popping into your head. Like I had such a great momentum. I was working right. all the time before pandemic and maybe that's it. Maybe I missed my opportunity. Maybe I'll never work again. And 10 months later, I'm a set of Amsterdam after 10 months of doing nothing. And, uh, with some of the greatest actors of all time, and it it was surreal. Yeah, no, I I, just, I, assume, I remember. I just I, for me it was March seventeenth, twenty twenty. Like mm -hmm. my whole my networks shut down. I was working for networks. They shut down. The things were here. They shut down. I was like, oh, okay. I was, I was to fly out, and a couple of days later, that shut down. Yeah, like, LA shut down, folks. Like you don't realize. But at the same time, the tickets because I went to Atlanta uh, at the end of twenty twenty. I paid for. Both way ticket, I think forty five dollars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because because nobody was flying, people were oh, scared, so right. so they were pretty much giving away the tickets for free. Yeah. <laughs> That's I mean, we're still I had a friend of mine who wasn't scared of pandemic, and I I felt like it's a little bit too much. All he did from the start of pandemic, he was flying all around the world. He would fly to Peru for fifty dollars. He would he would fly to Colombia for like sixty dollars, and he would be just flying around and just visiting places. If I, I, you know, if I felt that strong back then, I could have done, I wish I could have done that because I liked it. But I just, I just was like, I don't know what's going on. I just stayed home and did this through Zoom. I did all this stuff through Zoom. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that was, that was a fun time. Um, and you're right. There's a whole thing of like a lot of us were having momentum going. And it's like, well, can it happen again? Can it happen? And you're right. It can, and obviously, you're back working again. You have, a, you have a film coming out tomorrow. It's a murder mystery. Mm -hmm. A period piece. So you dressed up in a period piece, 1930s? Yeah, it it is a period piece, and uh, what an incredible work from the costume designer, from from people who who made sure that this reality is in the film. It looks stunning. It looks absolutely stunning. Yes. And who do you play? I play a Nazi. Uh, it's one of those German roles. The German roles. <laughs> He's playing a Nazi. Well, I want to ask you, how is it to? I know it's acting, but mm -hmm. what is it like to play a Nazi? I mean, we know knowing the real life history of nazis mm -hmm. um how do you yeah how do you do that i know it's active but how do you do that well i mean i figured it out pretty early in the game because i played nazis 16 times already um, oh, dang. yeah i did yeah i think i think it's uh, you know you have to have the right intensity without having it you know so it's it's sound it sounds strange but you project a lot of intensity emotionless intensity yeah. that's, that's i think that's the nazi way of doing things you know they're not very emotional but yet they're very intense so, so I feel like that's my little wow. trick I'm using for the Nazi roles. That's, that's so funny. That's so interesting. Um, you also played in the Staircase, which is a big thing mm -hmm. right now. Also, and what was that like playing doing on doing that show? Okay, so I'll tell you two stories from the Staircase. Please yeah. tell me, please. So I. 
talked to my agent uh, from London, my UK agent, Sarah, a uh, day before the, when I flew to Atlanta to do the staircase. By the way, I found out that I booked the staircase when I was heading to my birthday party that my friends were throwing me in. And I was just told that I have to fly to Atlanta next morning. So that's <laughs> so funny. The course of the night. Yeah. Um, and I flew to Atlanta and, and I told my UK agent that I'm going to work with Colin Firth on a, in a scene. And she said, oh, I know him. Oh. I'll, I'll, I'll talk to him. And, he, you know, sometimes you hear stories. Yeah. Guess what happened? The next day, Colin Firth comes to me and he welcomes me on set. And, wow. Yeah. And he says that Sarah is a good friend and she reps also his son, you know. So, oh, my goodness. So, so that that started things very well for me. And, and yeah. then another another little story is, and so I'm on set, we're sitting in like a parking area. I'm sitting with Sophie Turner, Patrick Schwarzenegger, and uh, Odessa Yak, just four of us for the whole day. Yeah. And Odessa is reading a book and she started, you know, we're having a little conversation and she says that she likes to bring a book on set because it makes her center. It, it makes her focus. Right. You know, when she okay. reads like a chapter of a book before she goes on set, on, while on set, when she goes into a scene. Yeah. And so I'm like, well, I have to get a book somehow for tomorrow. And I went, to, I stayed next to Georgia Tech University. Okay, yes. I went to their, so I went to their bookstore, but all they had was a technical stuff. So I couldn't find any book. It was about, you know, operating a machine or, okay, yes, right. or a truck. Right. You know, but I found that uh, works from Plato, uh, ancient philosopher. So I, I got that book and I came to set and, you know, of Od this I was laughing. So now we can have sophisticated conversations and, you know, ha ha ha. Yeah, yeah. But, the, but then I hear a shout out from the other end of the room and it's Michael Stuhlberg, one of the actors that I absolutely admire. Okay. And he's like, oh, Plato, I played it on Broadway. Exactly those were, you know, and, and we started a conversation and we had a conversation for like an hour. Wow. Okay. And yeah. With one of my favorite actors of, of all time. So that was great. That's very cool. I like that. That's very cool. Small world. Everything's small world. We, we learn after a while. We all relate to somebody. Well, That's you never know. And like, I, I could have picked a completely different book and I would never talk right. to the guy, you know? So right. sometimes the life is unpredictable in that way. That's what I like about that. Uh, as we wrap up, is there, I always say to people, you say it out loud, is there any kind of role you would love to play? You say it yeah. out. Throw oh, 100%. Uh, and that's the that's the role that initially, when I got into acting, I always wanted to play. It's the villain in the James Bond movie. There you go. The villain is so funny to play the villain. Oh, my God. That's, that's, not, that's, a, that's a dream. That's like the dream, dream, dream. That would be, oh, my God. Would be, yes. Right. yes. And my dream, folks, is to write the theme song. That's my dream. Uh, I'm a songwriter. Yeah, maybe we'll collaborate one day. We'll collaborate. We'll write we'll the theme song. We'll perform it. Into it. Universe. Let's put it into the universe. Put it in the universe, yes. Because that would be... Sprinkle it up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Martin Harris, for being on the show. You're great. Thank um, you so much. The movie is called Amsterdam. It comes out tomorrow. So you want to get in theaters. Check out his work everywhere. He's everywhere. So where can they follow if they want to follow you? Uh, I'm only on Instagram, which is uh, Martin uh, underscore Harris LA. Okay. So follow him there. Uh, yeah. for more stuff. And I'm James LJ, Extra Connections on Facebook, JLJ Media, everywhere else, and we'll see you next time.